Hi, Alex. Hey, Ayoto. Can you hear me okay? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Great to connect with you. Yeah, likewise. Nice to hear you from Taiwan. I, I most I was born in Taiwan as well. Ah, oh, amazing. Yeah. Okay. And I miss Taiwan. I've been following your work for many years. I love seeing you in the film in August at Akiko. Around that same time, I was. I went back and filmed myself and filmed my grandmother's house in Xinshi, close to Tainan. Do you still speak uh, speak Mandarin? Yeah, I still speak Mandarin, and I think my Taiwanese is actually better than my Mandarin. Than your Mandarin, okay, because, gotcha. Yeah, a lot of it's the op- it's the opposite for me. I speak Mandarin better than Taiwanese. Where were you born? I was born in Taiwan. I was born in Taipei. Yeah, so that was the time when I went back and looking also at my grandmother's and just looking at the whole thing and. Something that I avoided for so long, but that was just a little personal thing where I've, I was really connected to that film and that inquisition and self reflection. Yeah, for sure. I think all of us go through that at some point. You know, being having to confront these identity issues,、uh, living abroad, and being in between spaces. That's like a interesting way to look at it. It's like it's kind of like purgatory if you don't want to choose a side, which is what most people. In the right mind would do because you want to maintain this kind of fluid identity. But when you're a kid, it's very hard to navigate through these terrains. You know, it's like、um, you either have to assimilate, you know, adapt to your surroundings as soon as you can, or you remain petrified. You stay close to your family and you only hang out with people of your own culture, and then you maintain the language, eat the food. If you assimilate, you start eating hamburgers. You know. All these other things, you know, it's like they all come into play. There's a lot of weird dynamics involved. I used to think, you know, there's important things to, you know, messages or principles that I live by, and I like to share with other people. But these days, as I'm getting older, I feel like it's not it's not really necessary to try to enforce your will onto other people or hope that it might, you know, inspire quote unquote other people. It's just like everyone has their own. Natural rhythm of progression and where they're at in the world, depending on what phase they're going through. So it doesn't really matter to try to like enforce our own realities onto other people, you know, because it's completely. It, I realize that it's completely abstract to people who can't relate. You know, it doesn't matter how much information you provide them. It's like certain people just can't relate, you know, because they don't have the the background or the experience. Let's say, like, if we talk to a Palestinian or a Moroccan Jew or a French African, right off the bat, they would know exactly what we're talking about in terms of being, you know, having a weird in-between state of mind. You know, people like that, they understand. You know, it's like they know what it means to not have a home and to be raised in a place that's not ethnically. <laughs> like your people, you know, per se. But if you ask anybody else who were born and raised in one place, it's abstract. They'll never really fully comprehend the picture. They're just like, "What's what's the big deal? You know, why are you sens- why are you so sensitive?" Like we can't really force people to understand. You know, it's like you can only provide a context. I mean, I think the whole Israel and Palestine thing is like a pretty good metaphor. You know, people who can relate the pain. It's like incredibly offensive, what what Israel is doing, and then for people who can't relate, it's like it's not my fucking problem, you know. They don't they don't they don't fucking care, and it doesn't affect them. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't affect us either, but we can relate. You can you know what it what that feels like to to not you know to get your identity taken away from you and then like become nothing, and then you have to reinvent yourself into something. I spent the day yesterday just. Going through all of your albums and other times, and it was a really nice trippy experience to kind of time travel <laughs> with a person、yeah. over the course of a day.、Mm. I don't know if you get this sense, but with diaspora and hybridity, it's rare for me to speak with somebody that has a bit closer to what I have experienced in terms of the diversity. It was a uncanny experience to get a sense. Just from reading it from superficially, there's a lot of things I can really connect with. For sure,、um, I think there's a common thread of an, a certain、uh, narrative that we both inherit. Like we've 
inherited the historical and cultural narrative that's been passed down from our families. On a personal level, of course, it's different. But from a societal level, you know, it's like we inherit the same things. There are times where I'm thinking, well, okay, the personal thing, you know, the desire to feel that I am in my own entity and my own original experience. But when I read different biographies or different experiences, you can't help but feel there's certain limits to the variations as to what goes on in periods of life and no longer feeling the need to impose your own perspectives and inspirations for other people and trying to explain, but kind of letting things accept to the rhythms of life. For sure. Anytime when an individual is able to zoom out from their own experience, you know, like the old sayings that goes with, you know, trying to walk in other people's shoes. I think the minute that we are able to rise above our own perspective and then you get to see like the outline of the situation, you know, from a historical context. I think history is like incredibly informative and important. This whole idea of the diaspora and being in between spaces and between uh, identities, you know, to be honest, I, I can't help but think that our whole lives are the results of some geopolitical war games that happened a long, long time ago. And we we just happened to be like the result or the, uh, like the cannon fodder of history. You know, it's like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it has not, has not, nothing to do with us on a personal level. These things have been formed way before we were born and we were just born into these situations. And these kind of situations are designed to not give you any options. It's like uh, option A is you forfeit your identity and you embrace a new one or option B uh, where you maintain your identity and you constantly you come into friction, you know, and into this antagonizing surrounding environment that's like trying to erase you. So it's like, it, that's like both options are not ideal to me at all. And I think what a lot of us end up doing is forming our own option, which is option C. I don't want to be on neither side and I don't wish to identify with either side. And some people like pick and choose, you know, like I want to be able to relate to this part of my culture, but not that part. I want to be Westernized to a certain extent, but not that much. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't think um, there's a lot of options um, with what we're working with. And I, I sincerely think if schools like, you know, since, you know, even in middle school or high school, if they start teaching these theories, you know, like uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, double consciousness ideas, you know, it, I think it would like relieve a lot of teenage angst, you know, like these like abstract angers and like self-destruction you know that manifests itself in such a negative way it's because we're fighting these things these like historical narratives that we have no idea about and we've been gaslit by this society that we live in that's like telling us that oh you're just like crazy or you're sensitive while still mocking us through popular culture through hollywood so it's like of course you don't know what's up or down or what's right or left you know it's like you've been told this world is one thing and as you the older you get the more books you read the more information history you study you realize that's not really the case who gets to dictate what reality is so it circles back to what you were saying earlier like once you realize that there is no such thing as an objective reality or history it's all subjective you know once you put a certain perspective once you frame it it becomes subjective and so what we're being taught and what we're being shown in media or even like you know what our parents tell us sometimes is not you know it's not their fault you know because they didn't know any better they're just doing they're just doing what their parents told them continuing the narrative it's, it's a lot of work man it's a lot of work to like not blame your parents for anything and not blame yourself but trying to take responsibility for what we inherit and cherish like the values that's been passed on the strengths you know the positive things and try our best you know just like and try to live as easy as that may sound you know it's, it's hard 
try to be free, you know, quote unquote, try to live and experience life. It's it's hard. I talk I've talked to a lot of people and friends, you know, who have like similar backgrounds like us. And it's never it's never easy. It's full of trauma and pain, you know, and everyone's version is different. You had um one of your track titles from Divine Weight, Ten of Swords in the Jester's Court. Around twenty seventeen I was reading Yadarowski's Psycho Magic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I remember watching that film ten years before that and just thought, wow, like this is a trippy crazy kind of thing and it wasn't until 2017 that i started to dive more into his writing and his thinking i was looking up ten of swords and i thought that it's a very beautiful timely card especially for what was to come with covid and everything what was going on with you at that time in terms of coming to this particular card for example or this particular album well in the tarot um the, the suite of swords symbolizes uh, intellect, our ideas and the will of our world. You know, how like our, our independent ideas and will shape our own personal reality. And the Ten of Swords traditional deck is um, there's a person laying flat on the ground with ten swords stabbed onto his back. And at first, it's quite a daunting imagery because it looks incredibly violent and negative. But I think of it as the death of a previous reality and the beginning of a new reality. So it's like your thinking has reached that stage where it no longer serves any purpose in your life. And therefore it has to die, even if it's in a violent way, like that childhood or teenage perception of the world has to end in order for a new one to be born. There's a lot of symbolism, in, especially in the last few years for what you've been putting out. The image of the young gods what's your relationship with spirituality or has that changed or has that been informed with some of the early childhood relationships with it i think i just really like the 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 term like i don't know where i heard it from maybe it was from like a rapper's name or something but i just think of it like uh young gods when i look at toddlers I always feel like like when I'm big babysitting for relatives, kids, or my friends' kids, it's like I always feel like I'm taking care of someone who's on acid. <laughs> you look at these little kids and they're just bugged out. Their eyes are like enlarged, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like staring at everything, like trying to put everything in their mouth. You know, <laughs> like they're trying to taste everything, trying to touch everything, and they're just absorbing. Everything is like for the like the first time and i can't even imagine what that world must look like it must look like a really trippy world you know everything is like constantly morphing and there's like all these weird people that's around you like pinching your cheek and be like hey hey, hey like hi <laughs> hello <laughs> you know you're just like look you're just looking at them and you're just like what <laughs> That's like also a a very pure state of being. This is before the narrative of the family comes in. This is before the narrative of society. This is before the narrative of history. This is the cosmic level of consciousness where you're just absorbing the world as it is. There's no right and wrong. Everything is just goo goo gaga and there's no words. Everything is pure sound and pure touch, pure experience. And it's magnified, you know. I can kind of re- relate, you know, when infants, when they just start crying. And then when something is okay, and then they stop crying, like on a dime, yeah. you know, they'd be like screaming their heads off. And then something is fulfilled, and then they just stop crying. Mm-hmm. And then they look at you, and then they, they start laughing again. I can't help but be like, wow, this person is fucking tripping their balls off. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, Momentary <laughs> enlightenment. Like, yeah, momentarily they have gone into like a bad trip, you know, <laughs> like, ah, get me out of here. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, uh, you know, mommy's here and they're like, oh yeah, mommy's here. Mm, that's good. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, there's a lot of images also of um, familial relationships and it's something that I've been wanting to explore as well, especially with the father and son dynamic, especially going through what we're going through. And like you said, we I think we've been dealt very different set of cards and from our generation to our previous generation the gap is so huge Mm -hmm. because you you said that there was a few years where you didn't speak english when your family moved to hawaii was there a period that you said it was like being deaf 
Oh, no, that was when we first immigrated to Canada when I was eight years old. Yeah. And yeah, it was, I, I didn't, I didn't even know the alphabet at the time when I first immigrated there, you know, everything was like new. It's like watching a, a foreign movie with no subtitles. Yeah. I, we immigrated when I was seven. To, to, did, you, did your family move to Germany? No, to Australia. Oh, to Australia. Okay. Yeah. I was, gotcha. I was born in Kaohsiung. And okay. my yeah. family was from Xinxi. Yeah, I remember when my parents told me that we were going to go to Australia and soon you have to learn English. And I remember I had this really funny memory of like being by myself and pretending to imagine that I would speak English and I would just, I would just speak in tongues and uh, thinking, yeah, you know, how hard can it be? <laughs> then going to Australia and having this period I wonder if that probably sediment a very highly reflective period or, you know, like that's my formative years. And it was this massive silence and meditation. Um, and eventually the noise gets brought in. But I suspect that's one of the reasons amongst many of me moving so much that I do enjoy this experience where I don't actually understand what people are saying. And it stays in this kind of foreignness. But I get the same thing when I go back to Taiwan. I don't know if you feel this too. Sometimes... I feel like I'm watching a foreign film, even though that's my homeland. Um, I used to feel the same way. It's like some kind of bizarre nostalgia mixed with like alienation. Um, but I'm 40 now. I turned 40 last year. And, um, and there's a lot of things that has happened in my life where, I don't know, I, I think I'm relieved to say that I don't feel that way anymore when I see Ta when I look at Taiwan. I think parts of it is because I'm no longer looking at I'm no longer looking at this place from the perspective of a child. It's like um, I'd, I'd like to think of our alter egos or or even just our egos are formed based on trauma, you know. And there's like so many layers, you know. It's like when you immigrate to like a new country, it's like you encounter hostility, prejudice, and you try to adapt and survive in that kind of hostile environment, whether it's like, you know, verbally or physically. And, and then eventually you adapt, right? And once you adapt, it's like, um, I don't know, there's many, many different versions I've heard. Like some people call it code, code switching, you know, like they, they can switch between languages, they can switch between mannerisms based on the flick of a switch, depending who they're with. In front of different people, we become different people. What I mean is when we talk to our parents, we're one, we're one person. When we talk to our friends, we become another person and so forth. And the further we grow based on this kind of construction, it's very hard to find the original child or like the original self because there's so many layers, you know, as we get older and we develop, you know, we go through different, even more traumas and then we cover it up with more things, you know, like the, our clothing becomes dark. You know, we wear black t-shirts, we wear leather jackets, we have studded earrings, we have tattoos, we have scars and all these things, they start to build up like layers. So I think it's, it's natural for people like us. And then you go back to like the, you know, the motherland, quote unquote, or the birthplace. And you have this really bizarre feeling because it's the ego coming into contact with the original self which is like a child basically it's been protected by the ego all these years and when you're when you're back in the womb of your country you know your birthplace that child is desperately trying to make contact with you you know from your unconscious so that severely alters our perception of taiwan so it ties back to that acid thing again i don't think i ever really fully understood what i was seeing in taiwan or experiencing like this feeling that you that you mentioned you know like this kind of oh this it feels familiar but foreign there's like this weird abstract reality of our birthplace i finally was able to understand it once i took acid with friends here in, in taipei and you know, it was like five in the morning, we were like riding mopeds. And then I was kind of filled in on this experience that I missed out. You know, that it's like a very Taiwanese thing from high school and on. Like all the teenagers, they all have their experiences and memories of riding their mopeds and picking up their girlfriends or, you know, hanging out with their friends, you know, racing, and whatnot, chewing betel nuts, smoking. <laughs> 
so while I was riding that moped, you know, at five in the morning, like there's no, not a single soul in sight, just me and my friends. I felt like I was clued in on the experience I left. I was left out on. I had this feeling that, wow, if I never, if I never had left Taiwan, you know, if I just stayed, this was the person I would have become. And I would still be taking acid right now, just like riding this moped, <laughs> <laughs> looking at the same streets, except just with a total different life experience. It was almost as if Alex was just like some other dream that my Taiwanese self had dreamt of. And then I had woken up in that reality at that moment on that moped. If that, you know, it's, it's a very bizarre feeling. You know, I can't, I don't know how to explain it. But ever since then, I don't look at Taiwan as like a foreign place because it's where I was born. I can choose to relate to it however I want. My reality, my relationship with it is based on what I choose to input into it. If I invest personal relationships and emotions into this land, then my bond with this place becomes stronger. If I am a passive person, then of course, this is always going to be a strange place to me because I don't invest in any personal emotions into this place. So therefore, I have no contact. And when you have no contact and no community, you go to a place, of course, it feels foreign. It's always going to be a foreign place when you don't do those things. Yeah, I was saying that when you were, when you did the summer at Akiko's, I was actually making my own film with a kind of similar, it was really uncanny, just the thought when I saw it came out, I was like, oh my God, because I was going back to Taiwan because my uncle, my two uncles had this dispute and the younger uncle who was dubbed as the black sheep of the family sold his his half of the family San Ho Yuan and sold it to developers for money because he was in debt. And he only told the family once the developer had already planned for demolishing half of that house to make a new condo. And the family totally lost their shit. So I went back to document it, but it was really difficult to face it and be at the same time an attempt to be outside of it and, and to be an objective observer. Yeah. But that period, I was also taking a lot of psilocybin and kind of just contemplating and watching the madness unfold before me. But that was also a big period of my life where there was, yeah, acceptance. And yeah, I think the Ten of Swords is a very beautiful uh, symbol for that. How did your family react to you filming it or trying to like the documenting it? That was really weird. As I was filming it, that, I think that was particularly strong, this image, because I was watching the frame. And that really felt like watching a foreign film. And it was so emotional because when I heard the conversations or some of the things unravel later, they kept a lot of it away from me. Some of the, the details and information. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I would, you know, yeah. I, I flew back to Taiwan. I was in Berlin at the time. And you know, when my mother told me, and then I went and filmed it and they said, well, it, it's going to happen any day now. It could be a week, it could be a month that they're going to demolish it. And I was like, well, shit, like, I think it's important to document that. And then it just didn't happen. And I was waiting and, you know, I didn't want it to be demolished, but like, it's going to happen. But from a production, like my own film production standpoint, I was like, well, fuck, like, when are you guys going to do this? So I can you know, come and look at it. And then I kind of gave up because I had other things to do and it was just costing a, a bunch of money to just sit around. And I went back to Berlin and then like three months later, my mom in a passing conversation says, oh yeah, they took it down. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like I, I told you, like, this is a really big deal and I wanted to document it. And then she's like, ah, well, you know. And then she told me all this crazy stuff, like the younger brother, you know, there, there was all these fights, there were constant fighting. And the younger brother couldn't take all that pressure anymore. The younger brother took the cash and in a fight, just threw all the cash at the older brother wads of cash it was so emotional but it was a beautiful potent image of on a larger scale with what is happening with taiwan the the question of the identity of taiwan what is taiwanese what is taiwan is so fraught and so frayed and there's so many different chapters and so many different you know identities and ethnicities but people are trying to kind of create one idea of it what's happening or what happened that's just, yeah, and it's still happening in Taiwan is basically a colonial settlers way of rewriting history. You know, there is no such thing as Taiwanese people other than the Aborigines, you know, the, the tribes, the natives that lived on this land. 
everyone that came after basically cheated them and killed them and stole their land. There were like many different attempts, you know, first it was the Portuguese, they called it the Formosa, you know, beautiful island. Then the Dutch came trying to establish a port in the south in Tainan. And then Zhen Chenggong, the Navy general from, from the Ming dynasty came over and, and defeated the Dutch. But then while the Ming empire was in transition as the Qing, Qing Cao, you know, the Qing empire dynasty began, they defeated Zhen Chenggong's occupation of Taiwan. So then it's like, and then after that, the Qing dynasty lost against Japan during the Sino-Japanese War. So Taiwan was then annexed to Japan. And then after World War II, the Japanese left and KMT, the nationalists in China, lost their battle against Mao's communists. So they fled to Taiwan and told the Chinese people that were that has been in Taiwan since you know since the beginning of this saga and be like, hey, guess what, guys, we're taking over, <laughs> and like from now on, you're gonna speak Mandarin. So there's these all these different chapters of Taiwanese identity and occupation. But I know that when I talk to certain family members, that if I bring up the fact that the Aborigines were the real Taiwanese, they get really offended. They don't want that's like inconvenient. They don't want to hear that. But we're educated elsewhere, so we don't have that attachment where, like, this is my land, this is my birthright, so therefore I must claim it. If you acknowledge this, then I don't have that problem. It's like I was raised elsewhere. I have other, <laughs> I have other issues. I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to, you know, get tripped out over like who who gets to be Taiwanese or not. You know, it's like it's not my problem. So I can see it from a historical perspective and what the Taiwanese people are doing is basically the same as what you know people in Australia or in New Zealand or or the United States or Canada or fucking Israel you know <laughs> it's what they're doing they're trying to change the narrative which is this is our rightful land as we discovered it or we're the chosen ones God wills it we're the chosen people to occupy this land to be on this land like who is to who the fuck gets to say that you know it's like it's obviously like whoever has the bigger guns gets to say that mm -hmm. yeah right yeah so there is no morality involved there's just a distortion of reality there's only a distortion of morality and reality through violence and then the winner takes all the winner gets to rewrite the story his story I find it fascinating your translation with all of these thoughts with your music as well through the times and and even in your swift fluidity through different instruments and, and I think that's what makes it really rich. Tell me about your relationship with the image or the symbolism of martial arts and boxing. Well, I just wanted to rewind a little bit, you know, like the transition of like different instruments. Like each process is like incredibly difficult and hard, you know, to try to learn something new. I think it it has to do with the fact that I'm not comfortable with a single voice because I feel like there's multiple voices in my head, inside, within me, inside my body, and in, in my head that's like fighting to express something. And each different thing that I pick up gives birth to like a new channel of communication, so to speak. So referring to your question, like with taking a boxing, I, I think I'm just entering like this beginning rudimentary, like beginner's level of boxing, which is like this world of the kinetic link. There's like a kinetic chain. So like the old boxing dudes, like all these like coaches, they tell you like, you know, you want to, you want to hit the guy with like the floor, you know, you want to pick up the, it's like, you're trying to pick up the floor with your feet and then you like fucking hit the guy with the floor. <laughs> it's like you grab this like slab of fucking cement and you like slam it into the guy's face. And it always seems so like abstract until I started practicing. Like, you know, it's like through repetition, you start to realize like the earth is the source of where the grounding is. Like it's, it's like the source of your power, of your strength. And then you, you take that power from the earth through your toes and as it transfers, you know, it goes through all your nerves and like your, you know, your blood is being pumped through your veins. All this is like happening in a split second. You know, it's like in this weird nano, like fucking microcosm. So this, this power is being transferred from the earth to your toes. 
through your ankles as you're twisting, goes up your calves, goes up to your you know sciatica, through your hips as your hips is like uh, rotating, through your torso and then onto your shoulder as your whole torso is now contorted, and, you know, and then exiting through your fist as you exhale, like <laughs> it's like this explosion of energy. And then you like snap right back and then you start all over again. And all of this happens in a, like, you know, fraction of a second. And it's really crazy. So in itself, like, you know, because I, I've been like reading all this shit the last couple of years, you know, Carl Jung, Jodorowsky, you know, alchemy. And it's like, it's, it's, it's all related, you know, it's, it's really crazy. Like the earth, if you take the four elements, like the earth is the ground. And then he transitioned that into water. Water is the movement of the body. And then the movement of the body into like the air, which is the breath that you breathe, that you inhale. That breath transmutes, like through, goes through this transmutation process as you absorb the breath and the oxygen and it feels your blood. And then as you exhale, it explodes into fire, into energy and it explodes in front of you. And then you contract and it starts, then the process renews itself again. So I don't know. For me, that's like pretty fascinating. You know, like every split second, your body is doing that. And uh, so when you start sparring with your friends or people that you train with, first you realize like you're getting, you get hit a lot. And it's like, wow, this is like not what I projected in my head. <laughs> this is like very different than my mental projection. And you realize how much work you got to put into in order to like manifest what your projections are trying to meet up like your mental projections but then the deeper the more you train the more you realize um when you enter this this weird realm in sports because i have never really you know i played basketball in, in high school but not in a competitive way you know um in these kind of situations it's like uh how do you say it it's almost like time becomes compressed and distorted in some kind of gravitational pull you start to anticipate movements you start to it's kind of like chess you know you start to be more aware of if i go there then that's gonna i'm setting myself up for like a counter if i go here then i can you know i can bait him here and then try to counter him but you're doing this in like a fraction of a second like obviously we are not computing this thing as you know, as like how I'm describing it now, that's not the actual experience at all. The actual experience is almost like dreaming, except you don't really have time to really indulge yourself. It's more like you're trying to stay connected to that hyper stretched time so you can perform all these things without thinking within fractions of a second. It's only like, I think afterwards, then you, you can kind of go back and rewind the footage and be like, oh man, like... Oh, if I did that, I would have gotten checked, you know, or I did that and I did end up getting hit. But to go back to music, it's like once you go through like uh, intense training, like boxing, and then you go back to like, I don't know, playing uh, piano or saxophone. It's like your time, your sense of time gets stretched. The person I'm fighting is myself. I don't know if that's the case with other people, but. I'm basically shadow boxing with myself, the projected enemy that I'm confronting in real time in this like hyper stretch time is I'll play something. And then there's these thoughts where you already played this. What are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. This is fucking bullshit. This is not art. Like you're fucking copying someone else. You don't know what you're doing. There's all this like negative things that I have to sift through. And sometimes if you're performing that you don't have to, if you indulge in those moments, that's when you have like a weird moment, you know, like a hiccup in your performance because you, you are not in the zone. You're not focused. And then, and then you look at the audience and then you, you suddenly have this overwhelming, like, Oh, I don't know where I am. You get stage fright. People get tripped out. You know, it's, it happens, you know, it happens to people. And the ideal for me personally, the ideal place to be is that it's, it's that hyper stretched time. Like the, that's how I described in boxing. Is like you're just doing everything uh, intuitively based on the hard work of everyday practice and like this, the laying of this, the groundwork of laying the groundwork of this unbreakable foundation. 
so that it permits you to move around in this hyper-stretched time. Yeah, the, the, the sense of time, especially over, well, I think in general, time is such a trippy thing to experience. But yeah, I've, I've had these little moments. Psychedelics definitely help to lend yourself, but through my own practice in music or as well as doing martial arts, I, I get the, I get, I really get the connection. Oh, what are you, what are you studying? Are you I was doing kickboxing and I did a little bit of... Uh-huh. MMA. It was also a bit intense oh, right because on. in Germany. Yeah, I was gonna say MMA is hardcore, man. <laughs> what the fuck, dude? It's like I'm usually the tiniest guy in there, you know, like weight class wise. So it's just, which is cool, but it's also a bit intense. Like it'd be nice to have someone that's a bit more similar to my weight class instead of having these people like three to four times my weight class. It's yeah. I mean, they have a weight class for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the grappling aspect I find. Mm-hmm very interesting because it's not so much about striking and endurance i mean those elements are in there but there's a lot of slow analytical you can of course not in competition but like in just training mode okay well this is going to happen this and if we follow that in a few seconds you're going to pass out so what are your options here well you have you kind of have to like understand the human anatomy really well right like the structure if you do this this will break it can only sustain so much pressure, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. In in so many aspects of life too, like there was that and then BDSM as well. So in terms of sexuality and bondage and all those aspects, like, you know, that I realized how much it all comes into play. And then full circle with music, it mm-hmm. there is this aspect as well where like, okay, well, if you go down this road, the your options tends to be this, and then how would you maneuver that well berlin yeah berlin is like so open for that huh? the bds and stuff i mean i think it's it's really cool like there's no stigma or judgmental aspect there's no like this weird connotation that it has in like north america or in asian societies you know people are just like whoa kinky stuff like dark shit <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that was the the thing about north america right like this idea that for sure yeah it's really repressed. And I think I was having a conversation with a friend and, you know, saying like, well, it's, you can't simplify North America. It's, well, it's like, well, okay. But there, even if people are diving into sexuality, the foundation of it, there is still so much of Puritanism that you have to combat. Well, yeah, for sure. I think like all the Judeo Christian based countries operates from that. I'm just curious, like how, like how did Berlin um, as a city, it's because it's, it's so different than Germany, yeah. than the rest of Germany. Well, I suspect it's, you know, one thing I want to say was like the East Germanness, like the communism, but then there's also East Germany, other parts, which is very conservative. Mm-hmm. But definitely East Germany kind of had a big, just like China, had this erasure of certain foundations when it comes to religion. So I think that was a big aspect where they had a clean cut from that and created a whole new set of traumas. <laughs> <laughs> that they had to balance out but it, it it's kind of fascinating yeah, they, um, unleashed yeah unleashed. <laughs> yeah yeah so i don't know these days musically i'm also curious for you where you would take this now because economically social politically i feel like in so many areas we've reached a kind of late stage development it's very difficult for example i, I when you say you take on boxing or take on a different instrument and there's this kind of beginner's mind and that sense of ease and accomplishment as in like i know nothing but every little thing i do every day is a big deal it's like a baby right like you go like wow that was crazy i did not know about that like same with chess we've gotten to a point we've figured out most of the easy stuff you know or the obvious moves it just gets more and more difficult so musically as you've gotten freer even business wise or creative wise where do you go from here yeah, ich bin müde. I don't know. I think it gets easier. I think when the the older you get, the more responsibility you embrace. So therefore, I try to be more conscientious of what I'm doing. And I also give myself a lot of space to explore like what I don't understand. And then I try to understand it after I do something. I see it like as a daily practice. There are no days off because I don't see it as like, oh, it's like some kind of maintenance of some kind of machine or something. No, it's um, I see it as an exploration. Of course, there are days where I'm, I'm not Superman, you know. There are days where I get tired or I get lazy. 
and I just want to like sit at home and not do anything, you know, watch Netflix or something, do some dumb shit. But most of the time, I'm I'm trying to use my unconscious to like guide me, my, use my intuition to guide me based on everything I've learned in my life, you know, through experience and through the accumulation of experience, like through trial and error. So I still do the same thing. It's just like I'm trying to explore what I don't understand and about myself and about the rest of the world. And hopefully in that process, the consciousness reaches a certain, it comes into contact with the unconscious. You know, it's like shining a light into a, like a dark corner where perhaps previously you've only had like a glimpse of and then it's like something dark and something really creepy that you don't want to confront about yourself. What's your dreams been like this last year? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of different ones. There's ones where it's like very similar to reality. It's almost like a simulation. And it's like it, when I after I woke up, it could have been like a real thing that happened in real life. And then the other one is the other ones are very I don't know how to say, like very young esque. <laughs> it's like um, like I know that if there's a older male figure. And if it's someone I know, then it's my my consciousness trying to tell me something, you know, in relation to the archetype of my father, the authority figure, or like those kind of things, you know, like archetypes. Yeah, I don't know. For myself, I, I had gotten COVID last year, and that experience was most intense psychedelic experience I've ever had. It was like three weeks of mad fevers and dreams. But overall, with the whole lockdown, I've just been my physical I mean, who knows what is the real conscious reality and body, but my practical daily waking life has been very much under lockdown. So I don't really see much, but it's in my dreams that it's been one of the wildest years because I've maintained a pretty chill life on a practical level. Not much is happening, but when I close my eyes this last year, it's just been really, really intense dreams. I've been living more in my dreams than in the real life. How did it affect you on a like a physical level? Yeah, I had some of the the obvious ones like fever, cold sweats. Yeah, I would wake up in a puddle of sweat. It was just it was cold but just wet all the time and I lost a lot of energy and it really brought me to a depth of hell that I haven't experienced. The closest thing I can say is just a really bad psychedelic trip. Even though it might be, the feeling is timeless. That's the hellish aspect. Like it feels like how long have I been in this thing? But there was like obviously the other basic stuff like body aches and I felt like a dying old man. And it was the first time that I, re I really felt this loss of will to live. Like it felt like, wow, it was the, the first time I experienced this, like, ah, oh, like, it would be much more of a relief to just end it now. Mm, and interesting. I, I felt ready. It was a beautiful learning lesson because coming out of that, I really did feel like, a, I wouldn't say like, a, so like, oh, I'm so grateful for the new life that I've been given. But there is this like, it's a different experience to life. Maybe it was a metaphorical. Oh, death. definitely. Definitely. Because some part of you that's like, there's some part of you that needs to come into contact with your consciousness and it's manifested through that in some ways looking or listening to some of your albums through i would say like around before covid but like it felt like i could connect to that better after i had covid i'm not saying that people should listen to this that they should go out and get covid and you'll be able to appreciate the music better but um there was that's, 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 uh, i, I kind of like it um <laughs> I don't know. I, I felt yeah. like, so it's funny that you mentioned the music. Uh, every time I've made those albums, I was like dying in some weird way, in some metaphorical death. It was a very traumatic, <laughs> emotional journey and physical as well. So I don't know, maybe it's because I've died so many times metaphorically that, you know, COVID was like, well, spiritually, it was like, I was I was already in that state, you know, like my father died three years ago. So I've been in this secluding uh, what do you call that introspective that's the right word yeah i've been in that path for a bit you know so when the lockdown happened i was just like all right i guess uh time to read more books and <laughs> do something <laughs> and it didn't didn't really affect me the only thing i was worried about was like money you know like i needed to work to get to pay rent and shit so I was lucky that I had two soundtrack jobs that carried over from 2019. So basically 2020, I just stayed at home and worked on two soundtracks and that was it. 
but yeah, money wise, it was not a great year for, for me, <laughs> um, but that was it. That was it. So, so I feel, I feel very lucky and, and fortunate. Are those soundtracks released? No, I think they're in like post-production. I think one of the soundtracks, it was for, um, uh, Chris Yogi, who's the director of August at Akiko is for his, uh, follow is his next film. It's called the simple man. And it's also shot in Hawaii. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. I'm really looking forward to see it on the big screen. I'm I'm curious if the soundtrack will be released or not. What was that whole filming process for you like for Summer Akikos? It was very trippy because um, the character that I played is like a fictional version of myself and a fictional version of Chris, uh, the director. So we both kind of just used that character as an avatar to explore certain things that we don't really understand and haven't been able to confront, you know, such as um, family, home, the destruction of stalemate, um, this kind of stasis. Like I think of family dynamics are built that way. You know, like the father occupies the space on the chessboard, the mother, you know, the siblings, relatives. So it's all kind of locked in this like stalemate. Nothing really happens. We're like the little pieces that are like moving around, but the, the king and the queen usually doesn't move that much. And then when the king and the queen dies, well, not in terms of chess, but in terms of like the family, the dynamics start to shift, like all the pieces start moving. So I think I think that movie was about that. You know, it's like Chris's family, he had like his grandfather had passed away and then all these like pieces started to move in his family. And I, I really have to thank Chris for that whole entire opportunity because the experience was, was so dreamlike you know, and then it's like a rehearsal for my father's passing in a way. And because I did that movie, I was going through this fictional mourning or like some kind of weird emotional mourning of in a fictional world, you know, where I lost someone and I don't know how to find find those feelings back. And I'm like going back to the place where I was born and trying to rediscover something. And then when my and then a year later after the film was released, my father died. Or no, sorry, before the film even was released, my father died. So it was almost immediate. It was almost immediate. Like right after the film was wrapped, like my father passed away. And then I ended up doing exactly what I did in the movie. I was back in Taiwan and then like dealing with the estate and then just wandering around in the fucking forest, <laughs> just walking around. <laughs> And then I had this weird feeling like, why do I feel like I've already did this? And I was like, oh, it's fuck. I did it in the fucking movie. Like, what <laughs> yeah. the fuck? Yeah. I did it in the fucking movie. And then I'm now doing what, I'm, what I did in the movie in real life. Like, you know, thinking of the same shit. It's like, so yeah, I have to thank Chris for that. It, it really like, I didn't go off the rail, you know, like I didn't, I wasn't like in so much pain that I was like, I don't know. I never experienced this before. Like, I don't know what to do. It was like, strangely, uh, I was ready. You know, Was there something that took you out, out of that phase and moved you into a kind of a new film? I think the perspective is different. I'm probably still wondering, but I don't have that feeling of when is this going to be over? Why am I in so much pain? Where is my home? I don't belong anywhere. Like I don't feel I don't feel that way anymore. I've spent enough time in that purgatory that I, I like to say that I've graduated from that class now. Like my home is my body and it's wherever I am. It's when I'm the most happiest is when I feel connected with my body and I'm surrounded by people that I love and people who love me. That's my home. I and mean, it could be anywhere. It doesn't it's not necessarily a geographical location in terms of identity it's like i'm just me you know like whatever family societal historical fucking narrative they want to you know pin on me it's like before when i was younger it's like i didn't really study history so I, it's all abstract i just don't know why i'm feeling all this fucking pain and like rage but now after studying history it's like oh okay i feel this way because of that it's like um i've been told i've been taught to think certain things i've been wired to have certain reactions you know when i see a communist china you know or I, I'm, i've been wired to have certain emotions when i see when i interact with japanese people this is not me this is all history it has nothing to do with me i was just born into this timeline 
So when I interact with people from China or Japan, it's like I like to interact with them as who I am, not the baggages of my grandparents or whatever. You know, it depends on who you're interacting with too. You know, if the person you're interacting with is like a bigot and some kind of racist bigot, and they want to play that card, then you can just like throw out the peace sign, just be like, "Cool, man, you continue in the bardo. Like, count me out of it. It's like, have fun, have fun, man, have fun. Like, you're gonna see a lot of fucked up shit, man. Have a good trip. <laughs> you know, like I've seen enough that I've seen enough of that fucking." distorted warped faces already i've seen enough of that you know it's like fucking hell different layers of hell i don't i don't think of it as an afterlife i think it's like right now (laughs) like you know that kind of literary visual i don't see that it's more like this metaphysical you can see it in people's faces you know like when you know when people freak out in public you know, when ho- when a homeless person is screaming, it's like what they're seeing is hell. If you haven't eaten in a couple of days and you're dehydrated, and if you're coming down on some kind of drug, every person that you see on the street is a fucking demon. Of course, you're going to scream. Of course, you're going to attack someone. Whatever it is, it's like whatever that person is seeing, it's definitely not what I'm seeing. And it's the same thing with people who are hell-bent on their bigotry or certain narratives they want to continue and they when they chant certain slogans death to all you know blank insert whatever race you want they're in fucking hell they're not in heaven how can heaven be full of so much hate they're there to erase and to ease the pain they're demons you know you know like in hell there's demons that pull people's tongues out yeah right that like pierce pierce people's eyes and put boiling oil on people's skin and then pick people apart. That's what those people are. They're fucking demons. They're there. They're fucking like hell bent on this, like God wills it fucking narrative that, you know, they want to hurt other people like physically. They want to kill other people. They want to go into a church and shoot people. So they're fucking demons. They're living in this hell that they don't even know they're in. And the only way to ease that pain is to like torture other people. So the kind of space that people like us that that we previously occupy in is like purgatory. It's like, where do I belong? Where's my home? Why do I feel this way? Uh, I can't relate to other people. It's like, you know, you have no eyes, you have no, you have no mouth. Like your sense of touch is like cut off. You don't feel anything because you know, how can you see when you're blind? Yeah, like I don't want to live like that anymore. It's so painful. And then you reject people before you even know anything because you can't see, you can't see anything. You don't want to get hurt again. So you reject people before they can do anything to you. It's not a good place to be, man. What's your Chinese name? Can you pronounce it? Yeah, of course. Uh, Zhang Hongtai. Zhang Hongtai. Zhang is uh, Gong Chang Zhang, like long bow. Mm. <laughs> it's an like old name. Zhang, now Hong is Shan Dian Shui, the Gong. Gong Hong Shui, the Hong. Can you send that to me? Because I'm terrible at writing it. So you're not you're not fluent then. I'm okay. I, I think I'm just. My mom's a Chinese teacher, so she'd be very ashamed okay. of this conversation. Like this, like it's like, come on, you know better. But I mean, the reality is, I get a bit. I lived in China for a few years. That that helped mm-hmm. a lot. But when it comes to reading and writing, I'm a bit lazy. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's just like the trip you're on right now. You know, this yeah, phase. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I, I think one day it, it's, it's, I have a friend who's uh, from New Jersey. He's, he's Taiwanese, but he was born in Jersey. But he always says uh, in his broken Mandarin, that's like, give me a reason. It's like, give me a reason to do something. Or, and I always, we like, our circle of friends always like love this because it's just, just about a perspective, right? Once that perspective changes, then, then that's the reason. Then, then you'll be like, yeah, actually, I want to learn how to write Chinese. Actually, I want to learn how to speak Mandarin or whatever. You know, it's like you just need a reason. And that reason is completely up to you. If you feel like continuing the trip that you're on right now, then that's fine, too. Uh, if you feel like changing it, that's totally fine, too. It's, it's all up to you, man. It's like it's, it just depends on how you see it. It's not like a fixed 
state where this is Ayoto, you're never going to be able to speak Mandarin. This is it. This is like your destiny. Like that's, that's bullshit. It's like, if you want to learn it, you can pick it up just like that. If you want to learn French, you can probably learn it just like that too. You know, it just depends on how much time you want to, or whatever language you want to learn. You know, it's like whatever thing do you want to like put in the effort and put in some time, dedicate yourself. I don't want to like, like <laughs> nag you. <laughs> it's, it's more like, I, I used to think the same way, you know, it's like when I was like, 15 or 16 i was like oh fuck it's so annoying i have to speak mandarin like i'm home i'm like back in taiwan and i'm my mind is already in english i can't switch it back it's really fucking annoying it's such a nuisance but as, as i grew older it was just like i just got used to it it's not it's not really a big deal it's more like i made it a big deal it was because i'm compensating for something else like I wanted to be more North American. I wanted to be more American. So I didn't want this part of me to like exist. I was trying to assimilate and and coming back here was interrupting that assimilation process. But of course, as a child, it's like, you're not going to comprehend that kind of shit. You know, it's like, if you're like 14 or 15, it's like, it's like, oh, why do I have to speak Chinese? I'm already fucking speaking English. It's like, nobody speaks English back home. Like where is back home in America? No, like, <laughs> it's like, you're like, what? you know, your orientation, it's like your, your compass is off, you know, like when you're a kid, but we're not kids anymore. It's there if you want it, man. That's all I got to tell you, brother. It's there if you want it. It's like a key. It's right there.